I prepared a, a lecture, an introductory lecture on statistical mechanics and some recent developments um, on quantum effects. And uh, I thought it was for uh, diploma students in the Stasi lecture hall. So I went to the Stasi and nobody was there. <laughs> then I read and said, Budi, okay, oh, okay. <laughs> so I apologize uh, if uh, the, the quality of the presentation is more, uh, um, uh, it's more uh, um, at the level of, uh, of, uh, of a lecture rather than, uh, than a research talk. And also the topic, uh, if you guys work with statistical mechanics, you can sleep for 45 minutes, wake up in the last 10 minutes or so. Yeah, we are gonna, we are gonna play only just one, one slide at the end, so. Okay, very good. So, okay, so. So the idea is the following. First of all, I want to explain to you um, what is the aim of statistical mechanics and uh, what uh, are the, um, the results of Hamiltonian dynamics that we, we need somehow to justify the use of statistical mechanics, okay? So the idea is the following. <clears throat> in statistical mechanics is, is a discipline that was, was born to try to connect thermodynamics which was something which had been already established as had its own set of axioms by the middle of the 1800s, something like that. And um, it seemed to stand as a discipline by itself, okay? It was very useful to build uh, engines, steam engine and other kind of things. But it had a set of uh, axioms that, uh, uh, laws that seemed to be, you know, falling from the sky, okay? So, why the first law of, of thermodynamics? Why the second law of thermodynamics, right? Why? So people started thinking that somehow this must be connected to, um, to classical mechanics in some way, okay? And it should be possible somehow to use the laws of classical mechanics. Uh, you know, we are talking about the middle of the 1500s, right? The, uh, the, of the 1800s, sorry, uh, to use the laws of, uh, of classical mechanics to explain these, to derive these laws of thermodynamics. So, so the idea is the following. You take a particle, uh, you take a, a number of particles which is very, very large. Let's say something like 10 to the 23, okay? And classical mechanics will tell you that um, for and Hamiltonian, energy conserving isolated systems, what you have to do is you have to take all the, um, all the, um, the coordinates in phase space, QI and PI. So since I'm mostly talking to students, uh, if you have questions, if you don't recognize uh, notation or something like that, just raise your hand and uh, it's better this than other I speak. Okay. At this point, I think more or less everybody should. <clears throat> Where I goes from 1 to 3n if you are in three dimensions, 4n if you are in four dimensions, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and then we have Hamiltonian equations of motion. Okay. <clears throat> So in general, if we can introduce Poisson brackets between, you know, and any function of, uh, of um, phase space variable has to evolve with me. Who doesn't know what Poisson bracket is? Who knows what Poisson bracket is? It's not complementary, the set. <laughs> okay, there's some people not sure if they know. Okay, so I assume everybody knows, more or less. And so the idea is that the, you have the evolution in this very high dimensional space. The 
The evolution is very complicated, so I, I should be careful here because, as you know, in phase space, a trajectory cannot intersect itself. Okay? Because there is only one way to go forward and one way to go backward. <clears throat> so in order to describe the motion of the system, we need all the 6n values of the coordinates. We need the function h. And we need to um, evolve the system according to the equations of motions. Okay? So, By the way, I want to, to, to stress a philosophical point here. The fact that the laws of Newtonian, Hamiltonian mechanics actually have to apply to very small particles and to very many particles is an hypothesis. Okay? We need to test it. And it, there is nothing strange a priori in thinking that there is a critical number of particles after which these laws should not work. Okay. So if I tell you right, like this, you think that I'm crazy, right? Because you know, we, you know, we've been taught this in school, right? You can use F equal MA to describe the motion of a ball or to describe the motion of a molecule, modulo quantum effects, okay? And to describe the motion of a billion molecules should work all the same, right? But there are fields of physics in which this thing is still not clear. And one thing we have already encountered for sure, and it's the theory of, of quantum measurements, OK? So when we, when we talk about quantum mechanics, we call, talk about measurements. And measurement is not a unitary operation, OK? We say it's a projection. And uh, <clears throat> And some people have thought, actually have developed an idea that quantum mechanics, because of some nonlinear effects, the more particles you put in, the less behaves like the Schrodinger equation. So, and people have actually explored, the, even done experiments on whether this hypothesis is falsifiable or not. Okay, so it's not such a crazy idea. You should, should keep it in mind. That you know, it's an hypothesis. It works, works fine, but maybe once we will find that it's not really true. <clears throat> so, all right. So we have six n coordinates, where n is 10 to the 23. Okay? We need to measure all of them. We need to evolve all of them. But we really don't care about all of them, right? The only thing we care about are macroscopic quantities, like, for example, the energy, the pressure. If it's a ferromagnetic material, we might, need, uh, we might uh, be interested in the magnetization. If it's a conducting material, we might be interested in, uh, I don't know, the resist uh, resistivity of the material, the resistance of a piece of, a, of a metal. We might be interested in how much current flows uh, in that thing there. So I don't know, like the, the current, the electric current. Few observables, OK? Five, six, ten, depending on the, on the, on the object you are under scrutiny. You have under scrutiny, but certainly not 10 to the 23. So is it possible that for physically reasonable Hamiltonians, or Hamiltonians that describe the, the things that we observe, uh, we can have a simplified description when n becomes very large? So when n is equal to 1, we have a very simple description, a single particle. Just you know, use whatever method you want to integrate the, the equations of motion. When n is equal to 100, it might be complicated. When n is equal to a billion, we are saying that things have to simplify again. Okay. So first of all, so simplification, simplification 
in the and going to infinity limit. So the first quest question is, is this simplification true? Is it true that things simplify in the large n limit? Answer, yes. I mean, we observe things which are, I mean, the description of uh, the air in this room or that of a piece of metal, at the level, when we are really interested about uh, in uh, the energy, the pressure, magnetization, current, so on and so forth, it's a simple description usually, right? <clears throat> so thermodynamics works very well. So the answer is yes. Yes. Say that again? No, it's exactly the opposite of the integrability of the system, okay? It's exactly that. It's because, and, and we will see, the system is highly non-integrable. So it's at the opposite spectrum. Because if you have an integrable system, then you're back at the, at the point at which you really need to all the six n variables to describe the position of the, the, the value of the system, right? And all of this new variables, conserved quantities, are conserved, and you need all of them to describe the state. So it's exactly in the other end of the spectrum. <clears throat> so for example, the equation of state of a gas, which takes P, V, T, N, and other things, maybe <clears throat> other properties of the gas. The gas could be diamagnetic gas and have some magnetization, paramagnetic gas. So the, we have an equation of state. <clears throat> for example, for the ideal gas, you know, this is PV is equal to N kBT. Um, another thing that works extremely well is the first law of thermodynamics, which says that the energy of the system is the, the change in a transformation is the heat exchange minus the work done. Okay, this works extremely well for everything which is a macroscopic. <clears throat> Another thing which works extremely well is that if I take the heat exchange and I divide by the temperature, this is a state function, which we call entropy. Okay? So all these things seem to work extremely well. They, they work so well that they, are, they have their own logical standing. And they were derived from observation without even thinking about whether the, the, the system was made of atoms, whether there were Hamiltonian equations, and so on and so forth. Hamilton equations, so on and so forth. Now, another question. So is it true? Yes. Another question, can you prove it? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Or at least, not in general. Okay? So even for the cases, for, there are some cases in which you can actually prove it. Start from the Hamiltonian equation and derive um, what we'll see we will derive. Um, but for most systems, we cannot. Okay. So for example, take the Hamiltonian, which is the sum of the kinetic term plus interaction terms. <clears throat> where we give some particular form to the potential. Okay, so let me give you something like this, something which decays. Another thing that can be, can be considered is potential which is partially attractive and then uh, partially attractive and then repulsive to close goal, which is a good approximation to the interaction potential between real molecules called Leonard-Jones. So I give you this thing and I tell you, can you prove can you find F of PVTN? No, 
in general, I mean, we, we do not know how to do that. Okay. <clears throat> so, but if you remember, the, the, actually, the first thing we need to prove is that the system, if left to itself for a sufficiently long interval of time, reaches equilibrium. Okay? So this is the, the first, the zeroth law of thermodynamics. You put two systems in contact, you allow them to exchange, to exchange energy between them, and then they go to an equilibrium state, okay? So the first thing we need to, to prove is that such an equilibrium state is reached, okay? And um, And in, in order to prove that something is rich, something exists, the first thing we need to do is to try to define it, right? So what's equilibrium? So the idea is the following. I don't know, consider a, consider a piston. How do we define pressure? I consider a piston like this. This is the piston. Let's put some kind of dynamometer in here. And if we go and look, the particles come here and hit the wall. So we can look at, so every time the particle hits the wall, there is a momentum transfer, which is two times mv of the z component. Okay? So I have to sum this thing here. So the, the total momentum transfer P in the z direction in a time delta t is equal to the number of collisions in the time delta t. So if I plot this function as the interval delta t grows, this thing, this function is something like this. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry? No, the, the, it's the Z component. See, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's the, the, only the Z component which changes, right? Because this particle is going like this, and so it's only the component along this Z axis, okay? <clears throat> Okay, and the transfer, so, so we look at this function here, right? And we, there is a trend, and there are fluctuations, okay? So the average force, sorry, the force, which is the pressure times the surface of this thing here, is delta P divided by delta T. And this has a constant part plus some fluctuations. Okay? It's called the fluctuations or psi. So if my time t is sufficiently large, these fluctuations are negligible. They are so negligible that they are unmeasurable. And, <clears throat> and I therefore get my, uh, my pressure constant, okay? Another thing that, that one can measure, for example, take a small volume delta V okay, and count the number of particles which are inside the volume. These particles move And some of them get out of the volume, some of them get in the volume from the environment. So, <clears throat> the number of particles in the volume as a function of time t is a random integer number which fluctuates. There is an average to this thing. And if I divide it by the volume, I get some constant plus fluctuations. Okay? 
Now, if the, the fluctuations are small with respect to the density, then this is a good, it, this is a good approximation. Okay? So in order to do this, I have to take a delta V, which is not so small, and I also have to take a time T, which is not so small. Okay? <clears throat> so equilibrium must be defined in some sense in which we average over time. Okay? There must be some coarse graining, either over time or, or over phase space. So this needs to be uh, defined. So <clears throat> by the way, I'm, uh, here just just to uh, to specify. So there is um, there are um, um, there is an alternative way of defining equilibrium states, which is based on what's called the, the ensemble theory. Okay? So you take an ensemble of systems. You just don't take a single system. Take many, many copies of the system, slightly different from each other, taken from some distribution, let's say, and then let them evolve and ask about it. Since I've been working, so mathematically, in the end, you get the same equations. And I, I, I think mathematicians, mathematical physicists, sometimes like this, this approach better because it's cleaner. Um, but in, in the last years, we, we have reached technological control over mesoscopic systems and isolate them very clearly from the environment. And so there has been a little bit of a paradigm shift okay, in which instead of thinking to many, many copies of the system, it, I find it more convenient to think about a single system and thinking about isolated quantum dynamics. I find it more logically appealing because you, know, you don't really have many, many copies of the system. Then in the end, the results should be the same because the physics we observe is that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, so, the, so from these examples, we get that we have to do some sort of time average. Okay. And here, my friends in the math department will for forgive me if I quote a theorem, <clears throat> which is Birkhoff's theorem. Which essentially says that if you take, so it's based on, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, maybe Stefano. Has, I'm about to quote Birkhoff's theorem. <laughs> so, it's, uh, so the important thing is that, is that, the, that this map, this evolution map with the Hamiltonian dynamics is measure preserving. Okay? The measure, what does it mean measure preserving? That there is a, there is a, you have to define the measure space, measure space, right? Measure space with the sigma algebra, with the, with the target space, with the target space in algebra, and measure. Okay? And <clears throat> The measure space in, in, this, in the case of the Hamiltonian evolution is simply the, the you will measure dp, dp q. Okay. Good. So if you have such a measure preserving transformation, then the limit take a, a summable function and take its values over an orbit where PQ of zero okay. then if you take the limit of this thing this limit exists almost everywhere okay so it makes sense to consider this limit and from the reason from from the the smallest example that I uh, gave you before, essentially this limit will describe some sort of equilibrium situation. Okay? <clears throat> Good. So, the 
from, so this, this theorem is by Birkhoff. And uh, it's late 20s, beginning of 30s, I think. At the same time, I think slightly before, because in Birkhoff's uh, paper, he quotes von Neumann saying, the von Neumann has this result, but he's still not published it. And uh, uh, there is an ana analog theorem for unitary evolution of wave functions. Okay? If you take the average over the um, expectation values of an operator, where you take your wave function, you make unitary evolution, then for almost all the, in the wave function that you put at the beginning uh, of the evolution, you get a limit, which is well defined. Okay, so good. <clears throat> So, so this tells us that we can, so this limit exists, and therefore it defines some sort of measure, okay? And the study of these measures, this limiting measure, is a big field and wonderful field in mathematics. Um, dynamical systems, right? You guys are. Okay, so one important set of measures are measures which <clears throat> um, I want to say this correctly. So uh, are measures okay, so are maps whose invariant sets so let's take let's take an evolution, okay, for a time uh, one, for example, okay? So, <clears throat> this defines a map. Okay. So, if this map, so this map has some invariant sets. So, if I apply it to some set, I get the same set. Okay. If the invariant set of this map is the entire space, or the null set, okay? then this map is said, there, is said to be ergodic. Now, forget for a second my bad um, definition here. The idea is the following. The system evolves on in phase space and covers um, essentially all the available points consistent with the uh, conservation of energy. Okay. If it's let go for a sufficiently long time. So the motion is exactly the opposite of an integrable system. The integrable systems are constrained to be on tori. This thing goes everywhere. Okay. Good. Okay, I'm extremely slow. All right. So, <clears throat> In particular, the distribution that is, is induced by this time average is the equilibrium distribution of my system. And it is, for example, has to be a function of the, of the Hamiltonian. And in a physicist notation, is this is called this is the microcanonical distribution. Okay. Now, the difficult step is given the uh, the map or the Hamiltonian. Okay, prove that this thing is actually the the, the distribution that you get is the ergodic distribution. Now, the, here I, I need to make a historic remark. So, uh, but just by chance, I was reading, there was a paper by Galavotti that came out a couple of weeks ago, and it, commenting the old papers by Boltzmann, Maxwell, and uh, other people. And I found very interesting the fact that I've always been taught that the one to discretize phase space was Gibbs. And the discretization of phase space introducing uh, a, quant uh, um, a constant of nature which has the dimension of angular momentum, 
Planck's constant was something that Gibbs said. But indeed, it was Boltzmann. Of course, he, not of course, I mean, he didn't have in mind quantum mechanics. He didn't talk about, uh, he didn't talk about um, constants of, uh, of the universe, um, constants of nature, like uh, Planck's constant. But instead of describing this thing, he said the following thing. So the motion is this. Now let's imagine we discretize phase space into little dots, okay? Which is what we do when we, when we do numerical simulations, okay? So every dot is given by, by uh, an integer number between uh, one and two to do how many bits my, me my memory has in my computer. And therefore, the unitary, uh, sorry, the, the Hamiltonian evolution here is a permutation of these dots. Why is it a permutation? Because there's only one way to go from one point to the other, and no two points can go to the same point because it's reversible. Okay. So, so, for example, this is a possible permutation. So the, all the possible orbits in phase space are permutations of a permutation group of a huge, uh, of a, of a huge set made of all these little dots, little cells in my phase space. Then the definition of ergodic motion is Oh, clearly, if you have a finite number of these things, whatever permutation you have, it's going to be uh, periodic. Right? At a certain point, you come back to the, to the original configuration. Uh, and <clears throat> the definition that Boltzmann gave of er ergodicity is a permutation which has a single cycle. Okay, so there are no two points or no subset which is per permuted among themselves. Like this. Okay, so this was Boltzmann's definition. And it, therefore, he went on and described, um, um, you know, he, he found everything using this, this picture in his mind and in the, in the calculation. So it didn't have to do with um, differentiable flows. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so ergodic theory is a, is a whole branch of mathematics. Its implications are important, but not too binding for physics. And I can say this since Stefano left, so, <laughs> so they are too, too binding for physics because in physics, typically, we are interested in the limit then that goes to infinity. And this thing is very difficult to control in the theory of dynamical systems. And the second thing is that usually what we can, we can prove, we can prove things for Hamiltonians, except a very few and very important examples, like Sinai's uh, uh, billiard. We can prove things for Hamiltonians which are too simplified, maybe, to describe some situation. Okay. But the important thing is that the thing that uh, I want you to have in mind is about the thermodynamic limit. Okay, that's where physics becomes interesting. Good. Okay, <clears throat> so this thing here describes the equilibrium state. Equilibrium state is an average over, over a long time of the evolution of my system. So my question, the original question, is now turned into the question whether you can prove that the long time evolution of your particular Hamiltonian is, is going to give you this. Because once you have this, then you have all of statistical mechanics and all of thermodynamics. This is called microcanonical ensemble. <clears throat> In particular, let me show you how to derive the canonical ensemble to which we are uh, more accustomed from this thing here. So, the idea is that you have to take a smaller subsystem, okay? Take your big system, which is described by microcanonical ensemble, and divide it into a system and a reservoir. 
Now, this division is completely arbitrary. Okay? And the idea is that the particles in the system, so just what does it mean arbitrary? It means that you can also take as the system every other particle. It, it doesn't have to be constrained there, okay? It's a smaller part of your system. <clears throat> so, and the idea is that the, the full Hamiltonian is the Hamiltonian of the variables only pertaining to the reservoir, plus the Hamiltonian of the variable only pertaining to the system, plus some interaction. And if this thing here is much smaller, so the values of the functions hr is much larger than hs, much larger than h interaction. Okay, this is assumed. So typically, when we divide the system like this, this is a volume effect, this is a volume, this is a bigger volume, but this is a surface effect. So unless you are in very high dimensions, things you can, you can assume this thing. <clears throat> and so, if this is the distribution, if this is the distribution of the whole system, what's the induced distribution on the smaller system? Okay. So first of all, Let's put a normalizing factor here. Okay, Z of n particles and energy E. Okay, which if this is normalized to one, okay, because this, um, these measures have to be normalized to one because they come from an average, <clears throat> then it, it's simply the integral of the of the delta function. Now, the induced measure on the system will be this factor. times the integral over all the reservoir variables of the delta function of E minus HR minus HS. And we said we can neglect that part there, so I close it here. So, but you see, this is the same integral as Zn, but instead of n variables, we have n r variables. And instead of energy E, we have energy E minus HS. So I can write this as the ratio of two partition functions. Okay. And if I take partition function, if I take the, um, if I write the partition function as an exponential of something, this something is the entropy. Okay. Then I have the exponential of the difference of entropies. <clears throat> now, HS, as I said, is much smaller than HR, and therefore it's much smaller than the total energy of the system, which is conserved. So I can expand this thing here in power. But also, an S is much smaller than an R. So I can expand also, so this NR So all, I can expand also in this variable here. And therefore, this thing becomes e to the ds by the E times minus HS plus DS by the N times NS. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, minus. Now, Boltzmann told us that the S by the E is one divided by KBT. Okay. Because we can interpret this as the Entropy. Actually, this is a postulate in Boltzmann's mind. And it's the definition of temperature. So this thing here becomes a constant, which I call again Z, 
e to the minus beta hs. Okay? So the induced, if, if I have a big system which is in microcanonical ensemble, I take a smaller system, the induced probability distribution of a smaller system is the canonical ensemble. <clears throat> Good. From the canonical distribution, we can go to thermodynamics. This is quite straightforward. I'm not going to do it. So, so what's the reasoning, what's the flow of, of reason that we have followed so far? Hamiltonian dynamics, ergodicity, microcanonical ensemble, canonical ensemble, thermodynamics. Okay. Now, and then one thing that I want to show is that in doing this approximation, we never talked about forces or anything. But in doing this approximation, this is equivalent to say that the reservoir acts on the system inducing some Langevin forces, which are well described by a random noise, by a white noise. Okay. And this will lead me to the last part of my talk, So somehow, in this simplification, in, in the hypothesis of ergodicity, with this simplification, white noise will, will come out. And the thing is the following. Just, uh, let's consider, for simplicity, one particle, so I don't have to put indices. <clears throat> so dp is the force times dt, which is minus, let's put a potential, dv by dx dt. Then <clears throat> let's assume that there is friction. And then there is some white noise. OK? So these are called Eto stochastic, stochastic equation. So this is the force. And dx is p over m. So if there is random noise acting on my system, this is the mathematical way to describe it. Okay? Now, this mathematical way to describe it is equivalent to, so it gives me an evolution for the probability distribution p of x p times t, which satisfies the, the so-called Fokker-Planck equation. <clears throat> the Fokker-Planck equation is dp by dt is equal minus d by dp of minus dv by dx minus gamma over m d times capital P minus d by dx p over m capital P plus d d squared p Oh, if you don't know about Ito calculus, I, uh, it, it's very, very interesting. I suggest you go and read about it. OK, so this is a complicated differential equation, partial differential equation in three variables. It's linear because it's describing a probability. Uh, and contains both you know, functions of x and functions of p. Magically, if you look for the stationary solution of this equation, let me give you an answer. The answer is the following. Constant, which we call 1 over z, e to the minus beta Hamiltonian. p 
you take this function, you plug it in here, you will find that this function satisfies this differential equation. If you appropriately choose beta to be gamma over d. Okay? So kbt is equal to d over gamma. It's the same result from a completely different uh, calculation. It's not a coincidence. Okay? I don't want to claim too much, but it's not a coincidence. So what does this thing here mean? Well, physically, if I increase, so there are two sources here. There is, so the reservoir is doing two things to my system. It's giving energy through the random noise, and it's taking energy out through the friction coefficient. There is a balance. Give some, take some, okay? So the larger the diffusion coefficient for fixed gamma, the larger the temperature, because I'm giving more energy to my system. And vice versa, the larger gamma, the lower the temperature. <clears throat> Notice that you can actually, since in this thing here, the only thing that matters is d over gamma, you could actually take the limit of both d and gamma that go to zero and uh, take the ratio fixed. This will describe the same equilibrium situation. However, the time to reach this equilibrium, which is given by the gap of this linear operator, the gap is the, the largest eigenvalue, uh, sorry, the, the second small, so the smallest eigenvalue of this thing is zero. <clears throat> and then there, which we, of which we have already found the solution. And lambda two is, is given by one over the time that it takes to get to that solution. This thing diverges, diverges when D goes to zero. Okay? Good. <clears throat> So, in, in some sense, this ergodic hypothesis is, is the assumption that one part of the system, there, there are no forces, uh, external forces acting on the system except for, for this potential. But the, the idea is that the system itself develops white noise. And this is related to the chaotic hypothesis, right? The system develops chaos. Chaos is a continuous spectrum of, um, of the perturbation. So in classical mechanics, in the thermodynamic limit, what's the status of this hypothesis? Quite good, actually. Even exceptions like, um, uh, even ex exceptions like um, when, when the Kolmogorov-Arnold-Moser theorem arise, uh, in the limit when the number of degrees of freedom grows, the importance of the tori becomes Smaller and smaller, okay? So this hypothesis is well satisfied. And now let's come to a surprising thing. What about quantum mechanics? Well, we have recently discovered that in quantum mechanics, things are not so simple, okay? Because in quantum mechanics, apparently, there is an easier way to... So it's not so simple to develop white noise in the, in the effective forces acting on the system. <clears throat> and uh, let me give you an example. So let's take just a single particle. <clears throat> now I have an Hamiltonian, okay? which is an operator. And so I have to put hats over all the variables for a single particle. My wave function psi zero evolves with e to the minus i ht psi zero. Well, let's put also h bar here. Okay. <clears throat> and I can look at the expectation values
of, for example, the position operator, or the momentum operator, or you know, the derivative of the position operator, right? which is you know, derivatives of operators in quantum mechanics are just commutated with the Hamiltonian. <clears throat> So I look at this, and this is some function of time t. If I looked at this function here, x of t, come in, coming from this Ito stochastic equation, then I would realize that <clears throat> this function is actually not even differentiable. That's why we use this, this thing here, something that does something like this. And on average, some appropriate average, actually, the average of the square. <clears throat> Gross linear linty. Okay, it's not differentiable. It's like the stock market. So people actually use these stochastic equations in, uh, in analysis of uh, the financial market all the time. <clears throat> um, good. So, but now let's look at this function here, and let's put an eigenstate decomposition. Okay, so the spectrum of this function is, so here we have all the frequencies that, that are in, involved in the sum. They are given by the differences between the energy levels. The spectrum of this function is the square of this coefficient here. So, S of omega will be the sum over M and N by, but now I take the difference between M. I, I split the sum into various terms. So M and N is omega except for an error delta of this same thing squared. So psi zero. So let me actually call this P0N, P0M, which are this, so this thing squared is equal to P0M. <clears throat> and then I have the matrix element of the operator, XMN squared. Okay, so I have to sum over these things here. If I sum over these things here, there are, so typically, if the potential is smooth and everything, what I find is that <clears throat> this spectrum here is smooth, okay? And could very well be the spectrum of white noise. If I take instead a situation in which I have disorder in my potential, which is strong, then I, I observe a complete change in the dynamics of my system. And the particle that I put in this potential, because of interference effects, doesn't move too much. And then I go and look at that thing there, and it actually looks like this. So it's peaked, the spectrum is peaked over frequencies which are not rational related. And therefore the motion of the particle is, is quasi periodic. So we go from the particle that started here and went around, okay, to the particle which starts here and does something like this. A complicated Lisa Zhu figure around the origin. The difference is that this particle here 
goes to a distance which is proportional to square root of t, and this thing here is proportional. It always stays to order one. Okay. And if we have this, we cannot have. We cannot have. Um, Equilibration, okay? Yes, so this case is called, in, in this case there is, V is strongly disordered, strongly inhomogeneous, let's say. It means that if you look at the potential, it looks something like this. Okay? And here, the disorder, there is some disorder, but it's not too much. Okay. This would require a seminar by itself, I understand. What I want to, uh, to give in the last 10 minutes was just a counterexample for a generic Hamiltonian which does not equilibrate. Sorry. Yes. Exactly, that's why Anderson got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> yes, it, it's, the issue is that it's not intuitive, right? What's the difference? For a classical model, there is no difference between this, this thing and this, right? There is some disorder. If you go to sufficiently high energies, the particle will just take a smaller diffusion coefficient, but diffuse away, okay? But here, there are interference effects. Even if the particle goes above the barrier, there is a amplitude of being reflected back. And these amplitudes accumulate. They accumulate so much that they actually build these peaks in the, in the spectrum, and the motion of the particle changes completely. And this remains true even if you have many particles, if the disorder is sufficiently large. And what, what I want to show you is Now, let, let me tell you what I'm plotting. This is the last thing that I do, and then I will stop. So I take the following Hamiltonian, okay? And the disorder now is in the Z field. So these are spin one alpha operator. So they are representation of the SU2 algebra. <clears throat> so this now is an Hamiltonian on L spins, okay? The Hilbert space has dimension two to the L. <clears throat> HI, J can be set to be equal to one. HI are some random variables, completely IAD, distributed between, between minus H and H. This is a, a mockery of this, this picture here, in which this thing is H. So if H is small, I should have diffusion of what? These are not particles, they are spin, of excitations. Okay, I can create, I can start from an eigenstate and create an excitation in which I tip a little bit of spin, and then I see if this propagates as a wave, propagates in a diffusive way, or does not propagate at all. So for small disorder, this is, this is uh, numerics done with, uh, with computers up here. You create, so this is that on the, on the uh, y-axis there is energy, okay? So I create a state in which there is a lot of energy here and very little energy here, okay? So this is close to the ground state, this is a very excited state. And then I let evolve, the, the, here there are spins, okay? These are discrete locations. <clears throat> and then I let evolve the system with the Hamiltonian. If the system is ergodic, the, it has to equilibrate. And in fact, you see that it actually equilibrates. There are fluctuations and fluctuations, but it equilibrates. So 
So you start with an energy imbalance and then it goes puffed. If I increase the disorder, I start with the same energy imbalance, the same, okay? And I let, and now I'm gonna press a button and the dynamics is going to run, okay? And the system does not equilibrate. It's like having a, a rod of iron, okay? Putting one, you hold it in your hand, you put the other end on the fire and you stay there. And nothing happens. You don't get burned. So this is called many body localization. It's the thing that I've been working on in the last um, few years, three, four years. Um, and this is, this is going on. So it's uh, excitation. So if we run this for the, uh, for the age of the universe, it actually should come back. But, uh, so, yeah, so, because of these interference effects, quantum mechanics can violate the ergodic hypothesis, even for potentials which already have disorder inside. So the ergodic hypothesis doesn't have anything to do with disorder. Actually, disorder and H-bar conjure against the development of uh, over goodicity. And um, this is everything that I wanted to tell you.